All right, Guru Nation. We got to get serious. We got to get really serious about this one now. You guys, look, Comprehensive Guide to Clinical Research. I'm going to be referencing this book a lot during this video. I wanted to go in depth. I don't think it's been a while since I've gone in depth, but this one definitely needs to be done. So again, book, I'm referencing the book that we wrote. It's got this and much more in it. Link underneath the video description to Amazon. Thank you so much. And if you're there, please leave a review or a rating. It's been doing really good, guys. I think it's like at 4.6, 4.5. So it's been doing good and we really appreciate it. So today, I'm going in depth. I'm answering a question about monitoring. And I suspect, look, I understand that there's going to be people using this video to try to get jobs that they're not qualified for. I, as much as I repeatedly and constantly advise against this on my channel, do not lie on your resume. Do not say you have monitoring experience when you don't. You can do my CRA Academy. Students have been honest on there and saying, hey, because we give real internship experience, you're basically helping us monitor. We put that on your resume. Students have been getting hired. That's a link underneath this video as well to the CRA Academy. I know there's going to be people that are using this to try to cheat their way into the job. And you know what? Like. I advise against that, but to each his own. Again, I strongly advise against that, but that shouldn't stop me from making this video because we need more transparency about this field, about this topic. One of the reasons why we wrote this book, not just about monitoring, but about everything site related. Site, so let me go through. So it's a bird's eye view, phases, regulations, site level dynamics, monitoring, CRO dynamics, jobs, common vendors, conclusion. So monitoring is a big part of this. So I'm going to go to monitoring right now. It's chapter five of the book. And if you want, like, I appreciate you guys supporting the paperback, but we made the Kindle really cheap. So if you want to get the Kindle, it's only in like $3.99 as of this video. And people have been buying both. They've been buying the Kindle and the book, but feel free to like experiment, you know, just make sure I'm not a con artist or something. Get the Kindle. It's only $3.99. So chapter five, monitoring. You want the book because you want to be able to like take notes. So let's get into it. I'm going to go through the different kind of monitoring visits. There's five. Okay. There's site selection visits. There's site initiation visits. There's interim monitoring visits. And in this book, there's like reports. We have reports from my own CRO. We use these same templates in the CRA Academy. Uh, for exactly what you need to collect. So site selection visits, site initiation visits, interim monitoring visits, closeout visits. That's really what you need to know. We're not going to go, you know, there's booster visits, there's pre-audit visits. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick to the core, the four core. If I said five earlier, I'm sorry, it's four. So site selection visit. When a site is being considered for a clinical trial, uh, a CDA will be submitted by the sponsor to the site. Upon receipt of the CDA, a feasibility survey is sent to the site. Uh, then a site selection visit occurs. So when you're the CRA that's doing site selection visit, you're given a copy of the feasibility survey and you are, it, it's the most detailed report you're gonna write, but it's also, it's the easiest visit to conduct, but it's the most difficult report to write because it's a lot of details. So let's get into it. You got to review the synopsis. You got to review the study objective and design, visit schedule and procedures. They'll usually give you slides. Inclusion and exclusion criteria, the enrollment and randomization process, the IP administration procedures. You're going to discuss the investigator's brochure. You're going to discuss, you're going to ask the site, what's their process of consent? Process of consent. You're going to ask the site, what's the process for data capture in the EDC system? How many days? You're going to ask the site, what's the process for capturing and storing source docs? Is it paper? Is it electronic? Same thing with regulatory. You want to ask about archiving. 
when the study is over, how long do the sites keep it and where do they keep the records? Then you want to put comments. Did the PI show protocol understanding? Did the PI accept the responsibilities? Did the PI have any concerns with competing studies? Describe the process of the informed consent. So again, the book's going to help you with that, but I, I wanted to make this video for the people that don't buy the book. You at least know what's going on. Then, then at the SSV, you also focus on patient recruitment. So site selection visit, SSV, sometimes called PSSV as well. What's the total number of patients in the practice? The number of patients in the practice with the indication under study. The number of patients expected to be enrolled in the study given the timeline. What's the standard of care for the indication? What is What, if any, of the IE criteria will mostly impact ability to enroll patients? What, if any, procedures will mostly impact your ability to enroll or retain patients? Then, this is where it gets detailed, you go to the PI. So you got to list the PI and the staff, all of them. PI, sub-I's, coordinators, regulatory people, contract and budget people, any assistants that are going to be working on the trial. It could be a lot of staff, even at small sites. Like my small site right now, we just had SSV. It's myself. Then we have one other person. We got Jaime. We got the PI. We got the sub by. We got another sub by. And we got a regulatory person. We have seven people. And we're a small site. So at these bigger sites, they're going to have way more people. They might have like 24 people. So you got to get every single one of their names, title. You got to collect CV and current medical license of the uh, PI. If sometimes the sponsor is going to have you collect CV and uh, GCP and all that from all the staff you listed. Does the PI have enough time to do this study? Do they currently have GCP? Do they, does the staff have sufficient time? And again, list out all members who are going to be working. Make sure they all have GCP. They all have the appropriate licenses needed. They all have the ones who need IATA training. Make sure they have the IATA training. You have to collect that. How many years of experience does the PI have? How many trials have they worked on? How many other trials uh, for the same indication or for other indication? Same thing with the coordinator. And then list of the staff that are IATA certified. Next, I'm telling you, it's easy to do. It's hard to document this visit. Next, you go to the facilities. So you do a tour of the facilities. Are the facilities adequate to perform the procedures detailed in the protocol? Every protocol has its own unique things that they focus on. So make sure you're aware of the protocol. But storage for source documents, for example, and for reg. Is there enough room for monitoring? Does the PI anticipate using other sites? You need to know this. Does the site have equipment that adequately meets requirements of the protocol? Does, are the equipment calibrated? Can you collect the calibration log? Those are things you need to collect at the site selection visit. Will the site use a local lab or a central lab? If local, you need to get the info. If central, you don't need to worry about it. Does the site have emergency equipment on site? Which one? What kind of crash card, oxygen, what do they have? Uh, how close to the nearest emergency room? What's the procedure for emergencies? Uh, disaster recovery plans. And will the CRA have a private space to work, copy machine access, internet access? That's the facilities. Next, you're going to look at the, you're going to take a tour. You're actually going to take a tour. You're going to see where the drug is kept. You're going to look for a temperature log if they have, if they're willing to give you copies of the last 30 days, get the last 30 days of the temp log, who has access to this area, get that um, calibration log I mentioned, who's in charge of IP, does the site have a backup generator, uh, then you're going to ask about the freezer, so uh, where's the ambient storage, where's the refrigerated storage, where's the frozen for, for PK samples, is it negative 20? Celsius, minus 2.4 degrees, whatever is applicable to the study. Uh, if yes, how is the temperature monitored? Is it daily or 24 seven or continuous? Does somebody get alerts when there's an excursion? Who gets those alerts? 
as specific as you can be. This is why it takes a lot of time to write this report. So make sure you get all these details. Look, guys, I'm trying to do a good job selling this book. You, <laughs> This is going to help you, okay? Even if you just get the Kindle version, but the, the paperback is here. It, it's easier for many people to take notes in the book. Uh, okay, IRB, do they use central or local? If it's central, easy. If it's local, a lot of details you got to capture. Who is it? How often do they meet? How often do they take to approve? Uh, can you get startup regulatory concurrently while getting IRB approval? Then you ask for regulatory. So you get the CV for the PI and sub-I on all the staff, like I mentioned. You collect documentation, any, any previous audits. You, you try to collect that information from FDA audits, any previous FDA audits. Who's the person responsible for regulatory submissions, especially startup regulatory? Who's the person responsible for contracts and budgets? The monitoring visit, you're going to discuss the monitoring visit frequency. And in a day and age of COVID, you might want to ask them, do they allow on-site monitoring? I think if we're watching this in the future, hopefully we're over it. Right now I'm recording this in 2022. It seems to be getting back to normal. Um, however, I, like, let's not jinx it. Who knows what the future holds? So make sure you, you are relevant with the times. All right. So that takes care of site selection visits. Obviously there's a lot of detail here. This alone could be an hour or two hours, but I'm trying to keep this video, this entire video, we got four monitoring visits to get to the next one site initiation visit. So in between site selection and site initiation site obviously has to be selected, right? So the way it works. After the site selection visit occurred, the CRA sends their monitoring report to the sponsor. Sponsor approves the site. Sponsor sends the welcome letter to the site. Hey, you've been selected, or sorry, the selection letter to the site. You've been selected. Then the CRO or sponsor send all the startup regulatory, and concurrently, they'll send the contract and budget. When those things are finalized, the CRA will do a site initiation visit. Usually it's not the same CRA that did the SSV that's doing the SIV, but at some of the smaller CROs, it is the same person. So I have a study right now, it's the same person, same CRA uh, for my site. So what is all the things that need to be done? And in my opinion, like I just said, the site selection visit is the probably the easiest visit to do as a CRA. Um, but it's the most detailed report. I think the SIV is the most difficult visit to do. Uh, unless you've got like a really crazy site, then any interim monitoring visit is going to be the most difficult. But SIV is kind of tough because it, there's a lot of questions. Everything depends on you. Uh, the site cannot screen patients until the site is activated. They won't be activated until the SIV is done and you ensure that everything's done at the site. And we're gonna get into what those things are and as quickly as possible. I wanna add, during the SIV takes about four hours. You need about 30 to 60 minutes of the PI's time. With the PI, you're gonna go over the protocol. Your mo one of the most important things you're gonna do at the site initiation visit is you are going to train the staff with the latest version of the protocol slides. Please make yourself familiar with these slides. I know it could be tempting if you just got thrown onto a study and they tell you, go do the SIV tomorrow on the plane or the night before or the morning of, maybe wake up an hour earlier, review the slides, Google what you don't understand. If there's con meds, find out what the mechanism of action is. The PIs love to ask scientific questions during the SIVs and they're going to try to they're not trying to stump you but they're doctors so they think like scientists so they're going to say hey what's the mechanism of action of this drug and you're going to say well it's in the investigator brochure i'm not as well versed as you are on these things but from what i understand it is a xyz receptor agonist or whatever it is make sure you're familiar somewhat familiar at least know like the basics the macro overview of the drug the pathway the adverse events of special interest, 
which are side effects from the phase one studies, if it's a phase two or from the phase two, if it's a phase three, familiarize yourself a little bit because you don't want to be caught off guard. And if you don't know how to pronounce drug names, Google it and it will tell you how to say it phonetically. Google's, Google's amazing, guys. So what a time to be alive. Okay, so SIV, you show up. Most likely the PI is not going to see you till their lunchtime or something. So you're going to be with the coordinator and you can say, okay, I can train you guys. Who's here? Who's going to attend? So you want to get as many people as possible to attend. Anyone who does not attend, obviously you can't train them on the SIV slides. So the staff's going to have to train those people. So that's going to be an action item for you. So the more people you can have, the better. All right, you can give the sites the option. I can train you guys and then train the PI on the slides or we can just do it all together. If they say do it all together, that's fine. If they say you can train us first and then train the PI later, that's honestly even better because you can like have a dress rehearsal for the site for the rest of the staff before the PI comes, uh, depending what can happen. But basically, if they say no, then you need to start checking the regulatory. 1572 financial disclosure forms for everyone listed in box six of that 1572 form cvs of everybody gcps of everybody iata for the people that need it edc access irt access who needs it who doesn't have it who has pending training all these portals have trainings too edc irt labs ecg they all have their own trainings Who's missing trainings? Details. You have to write it all down, put in your report. SIV report is also, I mean, it's not, it's not as difficult as site selection, but there's a lot of moving parts. Who's missing training for what, where? Get all the staff. Then look at the delegation of authorities log. It's probably um, hasn't been filled out. So you're going to need the PI for that, but you can have the coordinator sit down with you, list out all the staff, and have the coordinator put the delegated responsibilities for each staff member, who's doing what, and let the PI initial and date start dates for everybody. And then let that staff member initial, and they, I don't think they have to date, but they have to initial um, next to their name and usually sign under their name. And then the coordinator can put the numbers, the delegated tasks. That in, in the book, we have example of a delegation of authorities log. So it's in here somewhere. You just got to get the book and you'll see it. But there's tasks for each person. The PI is supposed to confirm that those are the correct tasks, but it's helpful to have the coordinator. We all know coordinators do most of the work. It's helpful to have the coordinator do this with you, but you can't do it. You're not allowed to do stuff for the site. They have to do it. You can help and say, well, you know, typically this, is, this person does this and this person does that. And so then it makes it easier for when the PI comes. So that's delegation of authority log. Then you're going to have the training log. You need to make sure that that's done, right? And you're going to do that because you're doing the protocol training. So make sure you do not leave the site without a copy of the DOA log and a copy of the training log based on the training that you did. Make sure you get those two things. Make sure the site, then start going through the regulatory binder. Does the site have IRB approval? Does the site have the regulatory binder in order? Every regulatory binder has table of contents. Are they in order? Does the site have source ready? Is it in order? Did the site receive drug yet? Is it stored properly? Look at the temperature logs. Or were there any excursions? Collect that. Lab kits, same thing. Are they stored properly? Do they have enough? Do they have any? All right. Um, I'm doing a study where it's, there's complicated labs and they forgot to send me some of the things I needed. So make sure that you see these things. You're the CRA. Then all the vendor portals, IRB, who has access to it. Somebody obviously does if they have IRB approval. If not, you're going to have to make sure that happens. Um, and then all the portal, EDC, the ones I mentioned, EDC, IRT, ECG, labs, that's SIV. So those are the most important things of the SIV in a nutshell. Next, we're going to move to interim monitoring visits. 
These are the routine monitoring visits. They're the most common type of monitoring visit that you will do as a CRA. These visits occur usually every six to eight weeks, whether in person or remotely, and it's based on your monitoring plan. Whether it's risk-based, which is not 100% source data verification, or 100%, which is traditional source data verification, that's all in your monitoring plan. When you show up to the site for an interim monitoring visit, you've got three things you need to look at. And those three things come with a lot of details. I'm going to try to get through some of them. It's source, it's regulatory, and it's IP accountability. Overarching theme of all of this is PI oversight and patient safety. All right, so at the IMV, the first thing I like to do is look for new screenings. Were there any new screenings? Okay, then I got to look at the new informed consent where the, was the right version of the informed consent form used? Big deviation if it wasn't. If there's been a new version of an ICF form since your previous monitoring visit, all subjects who are still active in the study need to sign the new informed consent form. If that didn't happen, that's a big deviation too. Check those things. Make sure there's a process of consent. Make sure there's a PI footprint, meaning they may not necessarily have to sign the informed consent, but they should be writing a progress note about maybe what occurred or the coordinator. It has to be detailed process of consent. So look for new screenings. Then look for anybody who uh, had SAEs. Look for SAEs. Those are the two big things I start with. When I sit down, I talk to the coordinator. I say, hey, have there any been any since my last visit? Have there been any new screenings or new informed consents? Or, and have there been any new SAEs? So focus on those two things first, then start going through the visits where you left off. If it's your first monitoring visit, obviously patient one. If you left off somewhere, look for where you left off and follow your monitoring plan, either 100% source data verification or whatever percentage they say you need to do. So that's, those are the things I look at. Then you got to find, you got to look for deviations. Was there protocol compliance throughout the whole source? You're going to look, did they follow the protocol? Were there any AEs? Maybe it's not a serious adverse event, but maybe it's an adverse event. Were there any AEs? Usually AEs cause or trigger new con meds. Were there any new con meds? All right, cool. Are these con meds prohibited meds from the study? I don't know. Let's check. So this is where you got to reference the protocol, reference the source. If you have a question, talk to the medical monitor. If they made a deviation, let's say they gave somebody a prohibited med. Was there a waiver from the medical monitor? Was there some kind of dialogue that it's okay? If not, what is that? guys and gals, I hear you say deviation. Good, good. Read the book, guys, right? So monitoring is not easy. And back to where I started with, don't try to lie your way into this job. Patients, la patients' lives are on the line. Sites are busy. Sites have so many protocols, poor coordinators. I'm one of them right now. Have so many protocols and things going through their mind that if some patient gets a cold and their other provide their provider puts them on a certain med, you assume as a coordinator, hey, well, their clinician prescribed it, so it must be okay. No, the clinician has no idea what's going on with the protocol, if it's prohibited or not. And so the coordinator's assumption is wrong. Patients taking a prohibited drug, it's either going to impact patient safety or the efficacy of the data. Either way, that's your job as a CRA to catch that stuff pausing for dramatic effect, right? So that's one example of protocol adherence, the informed consensus of one example of GCP adherence. Then you want to make sure the PI is involved and knows what's going on. Are they signing labs? Are they signing ECGs? Are they writing progress notes? Do th their footprint, do they have a footprint? If not, talk to the PI. You know what? Maybe a little more oversight. 
you know, figure out a nice way to say it. Uh, we're not, I'm trying to make this video short. So that's source. You're going to do that. And then you're going to check with the EDC, any queries you query, any previous queries. Some CRAs like to do that at the beginning. Others like to do it at the end where they close out pre-existing queries. Follow your monitoring plan. It, maybe they give you some freedom to choose what you want to do. Um, I prefer, I actually prefer closing out queries before I start on new stuff um, when I can. Unless I know I'm going to be swamped with data, then I don't do that. Okay, so that's source. Hopefully it's clear. Regulatory. It's relatively easy. Have there been any updates to the protocol? If yes, you need to get protocol amendment signature page. You need to get an updated training log from the site. If no, easy. Um, have there been updates to inform consent? If yes, make sure all the patients reconsented that are still on the study. Make sure the site has that on file and it's the IRB approved latest version. Um, have there been new staff members? If yes, check 1572, has it been updated? Are any of these new staff members sub -ice? If yes, check the financial disclosure forms, check the GCP, check the CVs, all the same things we checked at the SIV. You're gonna check for new staff member, check the training log as well for new staff member. If they need access to any of the portals, check, make sure they have it. If not, it's an action item for a sponsor or, or the site, depending on who needs to do what. So that's regulatory. Um, if any staff members left, it's kind of the reverse of that. Oh, and delegation of authorities log. If it's a new staff member, they gotta be added to DOA log too. If somebody left, if a staff member left since the previous visit, it's still some work on this end. Do they have an end date on the delegation log? No, we need to get one. Do they have their access removed to all the portals? And that's pretty much it um, for regulatory. You also want to check SUSAR, any new SUSARs. If there's been any SAEs or any new SUSARs from the site, suspected unexpected serious adverse reactions from other sites, PI needs to acknowledge these by signing. That's for <clears throat> investigator site file as well. Now, investigational product accountability. A lot of CRAs, you know, what I just said, source and regulatory take a lot of time. They don't do it. They wait till the end or they let it just pile up. But they skip leg day, basically. It's not a good idea. Maybe once or twice. If you don't have time, it's understandable. But Try to be consistent with your IP accountability. Not only are you checking for protocol adherence and patient compliance, which is usually part of protocol adherence, but you're checking to make sure the site is doing the dispensing properly. So definitely at your first IMV, you do want to check that. Make sure that your site understands how to dose, how to dispense properly. Make sure what they're putting as pills returned or IP returned is the same as what you can actually count on site in the inventory. So that's there's master accountability logs, and then there's individual subject accountability logs, and then there's the actual IP itself, like the physical IP, and then there's the EDC system, and then there's the source. So all five of those things you have to cross-reference to each other. It's kind of a pain, you gotta do it. That's IP accountability. All right. Finally, closeout visit. Closeout visit is basically the opposite of a site initiation visit. Delegation of the authorities log is signed off. I think that's the easiest visit, but if you haven't done your investigational product accountability consistently, like I just said, if you didn't eat your veggies, it's going to be your hardest monitoring visit ever because you're basically doing all IP accountability. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed, they dosed properly and you don't have a bunch of new deviations at the end of the study. Sponsors love those. Your manager is going to love that, right? Um, so you get my point. IMV is important. DOA log signed off, EDC signed off, all SAEs finalized their ongoing and in the EDC system, the same. IRB gets acknowledged that site's closing, enrollment's closed. Um, archiving, where is it going to go? 
IP? Is it shipped back or is it destroyed on site? Lab kits, are they shipped back or are they destroyed on site? I think that's about it. Any queries need to be completed. So close out visits could be easy, but it could also be very difficult if you let things slide. That's the four IMVs or the four monitoring visits in a nutshell. This is the book, Shameless Promo, written by this handsome dude right here. I'm just kidding. Look out way younger there. And then this handsome dude right here, Chris. Uh, we appreciate it, guys. We appreciate it, Guru Nation. I wanted to keep this short, but like I know you future CRAs, you know, you should still do the CRA Academy. We only accept 15 students a quarter for a reason. Our internship is intense. It's a real, right now, it's an oncology study. Who knows what it's going to be in the future? You're getting real monitoring experience. I just did a job reference for someone literally before I started recording this video. So it's working. People are getting hired. They know all this stuff. And you got to know it too. And this video is going to give you like, it's going to tell you where you can dig further. But I don't think there's a substitute for real industry experience like the CRA Academy has. But I know not everyone can afford it. And it is it is a premium product. I do understand that. And so hopefully this video helps, helps you at least get an internship somewhere at a site. And then you at least know what these monitoring visits are all about. Guru Nation, take care.